All right, let me just really quickly make sure that we are actually recording. We are. Okay, I didn't want to, you know, record an entire video again and then have to redo it another time. So, I have a mic. It actually works now, you guys. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. So, thank you for kind of uh, struggling through those first couple of days with just written instructions. It looks like we're mostly um, on board with getting that all going, so that's excellent. Uh, there's a couple of people that might have fallen through the gaps, and we'll address that as we move along. As always, if you're having any difficulties, just email me and uh, let me know. So now we get to start covering our stuff for week two of imperialism. This is actually going to be our last week of imperialism, then we jump right into our next unit, which will be World War One, if I recall correctly. So uh, we're moving along as quickly as we can. I'm not going to deprive you guys of our uh, daily Amelia. So here she is, uh, giving her dog a walk, having a good time. Uh, this was obviously before it rained nonstop for, you know, like a bunch of days, but there it is. Our topic for today, as you can see with this horrible background, I have a different uh, PowerPoint program open office at my house, and uh, it screws some formatting. So this is actually imperialism in China. It's very, very hard to read. I promise not all the backgrounds are like that. It's just the first slide. So as you're writing your notes, imperialism in China is our topic here. So when we're looking at China, tiny bit of background that is relevant is China has always, up until this point in history, had a dynastic system. That means that they had uh, basically like a family in power, they had a dynasty, and that dynasty would change for different families throughout history. Uh, but they were always pretty strong. Throughout history, China has generally been one of the strongest, uh, most stable countries, except for during this time period. So as we're getting into imperialism, the dynasty that's in charge is called the Qing dynasty. Yes, I know that is a Q, so it looks like it's the Qing dynasty. Um, English has a little bit of difficulty when it comes to actually like spelling out and pronouncing Chinese words because they use tonal sounds and sounds that aren't really um, clear in our alphabet. So Q becomes Ch, the Qing dynasty. There are also words that have CH in them, um, I don't know why we decided to do it this way, but yeah, that is the Qing Dynasty. So the Qing Dynasty um, was not the best dynasty of all time, but they did still have that Chinese mentality because they had been the strongest for so long, and definitely within the region of Asia, they were still the strongest. They didn't really um, respect other countries. For reference to that, all you have to do is look at their name. In Chinese, the, the uh, symbols that are used for China literally mean middle country. The people to the north were called northern barbarians. The people to the south were called south southern barbarians. The people to the west were called western barbarians. And the people to the east were called eastern barbarians. So China very much had a um, we're the best mindset. So they looked down on foreigners, including Europeans, because they weren't the middle country, they weren't China. On top of that, China was pretty much self-sufficient. Even though the Qing dynasty was not the strongest dynasty of all time, and they definitely weren't the strongest country in the world when it came to this time period, they didn't really need anything from Europe. They were able to make all their own supplies, they didn't really value other stuff from other countries, because again, they thought they were the best. So they didn't really have a desire or really need to trade with Europe. That was a problem because Europeans wanted stuff from China. They, lo uh, they loved tea, which came from China. They loved silk, which came from China. They uh, really liked the, uh, the supplies, the raw resources, the materials that China had. So Europe wanted to trade with them, but China didn't really have a need or desire to trade with Europe. So Europe needed to find something that the Chinese would buy in large quantities. Drugs. Britain decided this is the best way to do it. So British merchants came up with this genius plan of all we have to do is get the Chinese populace addicted to opium. Because when people want drugs, they'll sell a lot of stuff. China did not like opium. So the Chinese government actually outlawed bringing opium into China. They outlawed the sale of opium. They, they outlawed you know doing opium. So uh, the British merchants essentially became drug dealers. They smuggled opium into China. And by the time we get to 1835, there were 12 million, approximately, Chinese people that were addicted to opium. And this causes huge problems for obvious reasons. Number one, you have a drug addiction going on in your country. But number two, opium 
If you don't know what it does, have you ever heard of like opiates or painkillers called opiates? Uh, we actually still have an opiate problem in America because opiates are incredibly addicting. But when people take painkillers, what does it do to them? It knocks them out, basically. So when you're addicted to opium, what you do is you go to an opium den, you take opium, and then you just lay there all day, just like passed out, basically. So these people are not working, they're not contributing to society, they're causing all kinds of problems, they get addicted to a drug, they start causing crime problems, but Britain is happy because they have managed to uh, find something that China will buy. And Britain can double up here because as we'll talk about in a, a couple of PowerPoints, India is a huge colony for Britain. So uh, what Britain can do is they can grow the opium in India and then just ship it directly into China. No problem. China doesn't like this. So China goes to Britain and they go, hey, stop. And Britain goes, I don't know what you're talking about. We're not doing anything wrong. And China goes, no, seriously, stop. You need to cut it out. And Britain goes, yeah, how about you make me? So uh, this leads to the first of the opium wars. There's actually two of them. And in 1839, then, we uh, opium war time. Britain sends in one steam-powered gunboat, basically, uh, to absolutely decimate China's outdated ships. Uh, in any larger scale battle, they have even more gunships to use, and um, China just stands no chance. They get destroyed. So we have our, uh, our reference down here of good old Britain beating up China. They've had enough, I guess. Um, and then of course, we have Britain over here being the best drug dealer. We see during these opium wars a clear display of how imperialism looks anytime you have an industrialized country going against a non-industrialized country. And we saw that already a little bit last week with the notes on Africa, right? The problem is not just a scientific difference, as we saw with like Maji Maji water in Africa, for example, but also just a production difference. Notice in this uh, painting, this drawing here, China does have some stuff. They've got a cannon. China, by the way, was the country that invented gunpowder, and then they mostly used it for fireworks, so um, they just didn't get aggressive enough with it. So it's not like they have nothing, but when you're Britain, you're able to produce guns for every soldier and supplies for every soldier. So yeah, China has a cannon, but aside from that, the rest of these people are using swords and what looks like a pitchfork back here and rocks, and uh, that's not really going to hold up very well against dudes with guns and gunships. Speaking of gunships, these are uh, Chinese junks. These are not the gunships. You can see that they're made out of wood. They don't really have any uh, big guns on them. So really, what are they going to do to a gunship made out of steel? Like, they, you can't take that down with these junks. It's not going to work. So China stands no chance. They get um, absolutely decimated. And they are forced to sign this thing called the Treaty of Nanjing. This is a peace agreement. And because China lost the war, they have to give up a lot in this peace agreement. They don't just give up stuff to Britain here. They sign it saying that Britain and other countries are allowed to have access to China without following Chinese laws. It's this thing called extraterritoriality. So you can see over here these spheres of influence that China has broken up to. So uh, Britain has this orange sphere of influence here, right? So in Hangzhou, for example, they'll eventually get that. That means that that's still Chinese territory. Britain doesn't own it. But if you are a British merchant, you can then go into that port and you don't have to follow Chinese laws. You follow your laws because you're British, and that's the British sphere of influence. And likewise for the German territory and the Japanese territory and the French territory and the Russian territory, that's still Chinese territory, but those countries are basically able to do whatever the heck they want to there as long as they aren't breaking laws from their own country. And realistically, Britain's not going to punish a merchant for breaking laws over in China as long as they're making money. So um, obviously this is going to lead to a huge amount of resentment from China towards not just the British but all foreigners and especially the opium trade because they're basically being forced into accepting a drug trade that they don't want. Unfortunately for the Qing dynasty, they're not going to be able to focus too much on dealing with that. I mentioned that uh, the Qing dynasty was not the strongest dynasty of all time. They had a bunch of internal problems going on. Number one, there was a huge population increase. In just about 60 years, Chinese population went from 330 million to 430 million. 
And you might be like, wait a minute, Smith, that doesn't make sense. You mentioned that for Britain, a Ch- uh, not a Chinese explosion, a population explosion was a big part of what allowed them to industrialize. Isn't more population good? Yes, it is. As long as you have the food to sustain it. The problem in the Qing Dynasty is they did not have enough food production. In the same time that their population increased by 100 million, their food production barely increased at all. A big part of that is from flooding. Uh, It's always been a problem in China because their their river system is uh, very expansive and prone to flooding. Uh, But regardless of the reason, they don't have enough food to feed their 100 million new people. So that's causing huge widespread starvation. We've got a famine going on. On top of that, opium addiction is not going away. It's actually increasing because remember, Britain won those opium wars. So they start running into a problem. And this problem is going to be solved by Jesus's Chinese brother. You guys think I'm joking, but I'm being serious. I'll tell you here. So there's this thing called the Taiping Rebellion, right? The Chinese rebelled not against the foreigners, the Europeans, they rebelled against the Qing dynasty because the Qing dynasty wasn't addressing their problems. They weren't fixing things for them. The Chinese people wanted to share in the wealth that the upper class had because when I say the Qing dynasty is suffering, we've seen enough of history by now to know that that doesn't mean that the people at the top are suffering. The rich people are not doing poorly. It's the poor people. It's the peasants, the people that are starving. So the Chinese people say, hey, we want no more poverty. We want to share in the wealth. We want to make this work. Our farmland has been hurt by flooding. We're not getting enough food. So um, they rise up. They actually gather around, and here's where Jesus' Chinese brother comes in, this dude who said that uh, he was sent down by God to earth. Uh, to lead them in revolution and to, you know, bring equalities to society. And he was going to create like a a paradise for everybody. Um, And the result of this revolution was terrible. Remember that it is farmers that are revolting. So a lot of fighting that happens is in farmland and a bunch of that farmland gets destroyed. And they're already suffering from not enough food. Well, if your farmland gets destroyed, what else gets destroyed? Your food does. On top of that, the revolution was incredibly bloody. We're looking at at least 20 million people dying and then adding starvation on top of that. Um, This is not good for the people of the Qing Dynasty or really the Qing Dynasty in general. And here's uh, Hong Shu Chuan, I believe is how we say it, uh, is the, you know, that's Jesus's brother right there. Like the spitting image of Jesus, right? Just Chinese, I guess. So um, spoiler alert, that guy wasn't... uh, anybody well i'm sure he was somebody's brother but he wasn't uh sent down to earth by anybody he was just a random dude that uh wanted to get some power so at this point china is really struggling enter america now america becomes kind of an unintentional savior of china i don't want to give us too much credit here we were not in any way trying to help china america wanted money so china has been weakened They are now very much open to attack by foreign countries. America comes onto the scene in the late 1800s because we were busy trying to industrialize and catch up to the rest of the world. We're still not really a big world power at this point. And when we're looking at America's ability to imperialize and trade with people, we don't have too many options. Because if you go east from America, you hit Europe. We're not going to imperialize Europe. Africa's already been taken up by the rest of Europe, so we're not really going to be able to imperialize Africa very much. where else can we go? We can go west. And then you got a huge open Pacific Ocean with not much options. And then you hit Asia. The biggest country in Asia is China. America wants in. The problem is, let's go back for a second here. Where is America going to get in here? China's already been carved up into spheres of influence. So America goes, well, crud. How are we going to trade with China if we got these spheres of influence, because Britain's not going to let American merchants into their sphere of influence. That's not going to be okay. So America kind of proposes this thing called the open door policy, which basically says China should open their door to all merchants, all merchants, all businesses of all nations. Everybody gets to trade with China and China does not get to say no. So basically get rid of spheres of influence and then open up China to everybody and China cannot refuse. 
And America's really sneaky in how we do this because nobody except for America really wants to do this. But what we do is like we go to France and we're like, hey, uh, Britain and Germany and Russia, they already agreed to do this. Like you should probably hop on board as well. And then we go to like Britain and we're like, hey, we definitely just got France on board with this. Like you got to hop on. We basically told everybody that everybody else is okay with it without anybody actually being okay with it. And then we just kind of declared, okay, we're doing it. And then once we started doing it, everybody was kind of just forced to agree with it. So uh, we lied our way into opening the door up to China. Here's where the unintentional savior part of China comes in. Because previously, if Britain wanted more territory in China, they'd have to go take it from China. And maybe they're going to go take French territory. So France would be upset about that. But Britain on their own can take France. But now everybody gets to trade with China. So if Britain, for example, decides they want exclusive trading rights in one part of China and they go try to take it over, what's going to happen? The rest of Europe and America are going to fight them over it. And Britain might be able to take one or two European countries, but all of Europe plus Britain? Eh, probably not. So this actually protects China from colonization because no individual country can come in and take over. They are, however, forced to trade with people and, you know, all that stuff, but eh, you do what you do. China has one more problem. It's the boxers. So those poor peasants, those workers, are still not thrilled with their lot in life. They still really don't like foreigners, and they really don't like foreign ideas, including Christianity. So they're very anti-everything foreign. And some of them form this group called the Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fists, which uh, is a really cool name, but is also really long, so they just get called the Boxers. And um, they decide that they're going to overthrow the Empress of the Qing Dynasty, set up their own government, and kick out all the foreigners. Now, uh, we talked about, well, I mean, it was in notes, we didn't talk about it this way, but last week you guys looked at uh, Maji Maji Water. And I mentioned in that PowerPoint that this isn't just like, you know, an African thing, like, haha, those silly African tribes, they thought that like magic can protect them from bullets. Most pre-industrial societies had beliefs similar to that. The boxers are no exception. The reason they were called the boxers is they did like a special uh, martial arts routine, like you've ever seen like old people in the park doing Tai Chi or something, kind of like that where they, they go through like this movement and they have these like uh, charms they put on them and they believed if they did this routine and they wore these charms, they would be immune to bullets. Much like Maji Maji Water, they are not actually immune to bullets. So. Uh, the Boxer Rebellion gets absolutely crushed, not just by the Qing Dynasty, but a, a coalition of Western powers and Japan. Japan's going to be kind of included in the West on this one. Uh, roll in. They annihilate the rebellion, and it fails to get rid of the, the Qing Empress. That being said, it doesn't actually fail to get rid of the Qing Empress, because even though the revolution itself failed, there's still a huge, strong sense of nationalism in China. There's a strong sense of anti-Qing dynasty uh, mindset, and it weakens the government so much that the Qing dynasty does actually lose power. This is the end of a millennium, actually multiple millenniums, because the first dynasties in China were back in like 2000 uh, BCE. So they've been around for like almost 4,000 years at this point. Uh, and that's just gone now. That's done. There's no more dynasties. The Qing are out. They're going to get a new government, um, but it's still going to be controlled basically by the West, because as our final bullet point here says, China does not successfully manage to fight imperialism. They get destroyed. So they're not really going to be able to do much uh, in terms of that. And that is going to be a big uh, feature going forward into Japan's involvement in this region. So uh, we can see here the boxers, they're getting outboxed by Uncle Sam here with his uh, gunboat boxing gloves. Um, sure, why not? So what you guys are going to do for the assignment I assign after this is there are uh, some cartoons I'm going to post up there. You're going to look through them, and you're just going to do some analysis of them. You are eventually going to be making your own political cartoon when we get to the interwar years. Um, that'll maybe be in class, or if um, our remote learning gets extended, it might be online. 
Either way, uh, we want to start kind of looking at political cartoons and breaking down like what's going on with them. Keep in mind, you're going to be getting a lot of symbolism in there. Like obviously some of these guys are um, labeled for who they are, but then you also get like clearly that's going to be Britain, right? It's a lion. He's got a red coat on. Um, the the rooster over here is actually France. This is the, the animal symbol for France. A lot of times countries are depicted as animals in uh, these kinds of things. Um, and it's all about symbolism, right? We have China being dead here. They're fighting over the dead corpse of China and they're fighting each other, right? So they're kind of tearing each other apart over trying to get into this Chinese territory. So you're gonna go through that, follow the instructions on it, finish it up. And uh, then we will move on to Japan and uh, India being our other ones for this unit. Thanks for listening.